indeed we now start with the first talk of our mini symposium on dynamics of complex uh, complex networks from nature to technology. Our first speaker will be Mirko Goldman from Berlin um, uh, with this presentation on deep time delay reservoir computing, dynamics and memory capacity. Mirko, the audience is yours. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about deep time delay reservoir computing with a focus on dynamics and the memory capacity of such systems. This work was done by uh, Felix Kester, Kati Lutke, Sergei Anschuk and me. We all work at the TU Berlin and all results I'm going to present today are available in a preprint at Archive. Uh, the link will also be on the last slide. So as a short outline, I'm going to start to introduce the reservoir computing scheme, give a short introduction of the deep, dilem, uh, deep time delay reservoir computing which we use, then we will have a look on bifurcation diagrams of such systems. We want to, uh, I'm going to talk about generalized synchronization between the layers. Um, then there will be a part about the memory capacity. We will compare them to the conditional Lyapunov exponent and show delay resonances. And in the end, I'm going to show that these uh, systems have a really good performance at prediction tasks. And then there will be a short conclusion. So let me start to introduce the uh, reservoir computing scheme. The reservoir computing scheme was introduced in 2001 by Herbert Jäger. Um, it, is, it is a machine learning method for supervised learning of input and output pairs. And yeah, the reservoir computing scheme has three main layers. There is the uh, input layer where we have a, a pre-processing of the input, uh, S of K. The input is then feed to the reservoir, whereas the reservoir can be any uh, extended dynamic system, but mostly there are networks and delay system used. I'm gonna also use uh, delay systems in the following. And uh, yeah, the output layer is given by a readout of the reservoir state. And then we do a linear combination using uh, the weightings WI in order to get the prediction O hat of K. This uh, scheme has several advantages. We have a really simple uh, training scheme. So the linear regression can, is given in a closed form so we can really do it efficiently. Um, and uh, the reservoir is also uh, really simple so we can uh, build analog implementations Example, uh, for example, a laser with external cavity can be used to build up reservoir. Um, there are also some disadvantages. So we have a restricted network topology. That means we do not optimize the reservoir during the training. So it's not perfect, perfectly adapted to the task and therefore the reservoir needs to be much larger than in a fully trainable uh, attempt. And also the performance of the uh, reservoir computing scheme uh, depends on or strongly depends on the parameters of the reservoir and that's more or less like a black box function. So yeah, the important part is that the reservoir is not trained in this case. In our attempt, we try to find a structure of the reservoir. We, uh, then we try to understand the behavior of this reservoir. And in the end, we try to increase the performance using our knowledge and that we, and this we did using the deep time delay reservoir computing. We use the memory capacity and conditional Lyapunov exponents to understand the behavior. And in the end, we used the Bayesian optimization uh, method to increase the performance. Now to the used uh, scheme, the deep time delay reservoir computing uses a time multiplexing in the input preprocessing. That means we have a, um, we hold and sample our inputs S of K for a clock cycle T. Uh, the clock cycle will be 25 during uh, the presentation. And uh, we multiply each clock cycle by a mask. The mask is a, a clock cycle periodic function, which has 25 steps in this case. And accordingly, we generate uh, 25 uh, virtual nodes and uh, Using this time multiplexing, we gain a uh, time continuous input sequence U of T, which we then feed to our reservoir. The reservoir is given by several layers, which are shown here in blue. So it's from V1 to V uppercase L. 
um, yeah, the input only goes to the first layer and then the layers are uh, connected in a unidirectional manner and the coupling is instantaneously. Uh, additionally, every layer features a uh, self-feedback loop with a delay tor, uh, and the delays can be different between the layers, so we can set them arbitrarily. In the output layer of the scheme, we uh, record all states of the uh, reservoir and do, again, a li simple linear combination with uh, the trained weights. Um, to increase our network, we now have two possibilities. We can add virtual nodes, which increases the network, but also slows down the computational time. The, the, this becomes clear if you look at this equation here. The clock cycle is given by the number of virtual nodes. If you increase the virtual nodes, the clock cycle increases, and uh, the clock cycle defines the rate of the input feeding. So using uh, more virtual nodes, the computational time is slowed down. Um, now for the deep system, we can also add layers to increase the network. And here we have the uh, advantage that we have a constant uh, computational speed. Now to the dynamics of the systems, for every layer, we used a nonlinear Ikeda delay system, uh, which is go given by the following equations here. So we have a sine squared nonlinearity with a delay term and a delay tor L. And we have here the input coupling uh, with an input gain kappa L and uh, the input sequence JL of T. Um, this input sequence depends on the depth of the layer. So the first layer gets the uh, input sequence U of T from the time multiplexing and uh, the deeper layers uh, receive the state of the of their previous layer. I emphasize these parameters uh, here because uh, we're gonna do scans in the following. So beta L is the feedback gain and tor L is the delay. Um, let's have a look on the bifurcation diagrams of a two layer deep system. Um, we have here the equations. Um, both delays of the system are set to 30. The uh, phase shift is set to 0.2 in both layers, and we scan beta 1 and beta 2. Um, in A, you can see the uh, bifurcation diagram of the first layer. We have uh, two set of node bifurcations here, and uh, by stability in between. So we have here two stable equilibria. Um, if we further increase beta 1, we have a Hopf bifurcation leading to periodic oscillations and a period doubling cascade leading to complex dynamics. For the second layer, uh, we kept beta 1 fixed in B, um, and we see there is a stable equilibria at zero um, until we reach a subcritical Hopf bifurcation H2. And we also found a fault bifurcation F1 where an a unstable limit cycle becomes stable here. And in between both bifurcations, we have a coexistence of the stable equilibria and the limit cycle. In C, you can see the uh, full two layer system. The vertical lines uh, give the bifurcations occurring in the first layer and um, the curved lines are the bifurcations in the second layer as they depend on beta one and beta two. Now we evaluated the generalized synchronization of a two-layer system. Generalized synchronization in this case means that after a initial transient, uh, there is a functional relation between the input and the state of a system. Um, in order to evaluate this, we have a, a weak input gain, kappa one, which is set to all point, uh, 0 0.01. Uh, and we use the uh, auxiliary system method in order to verify if there is generalized, uh, generalized synchronization. So that means we have uh, two identical systems, V of T and V tilt of T. And these identical uh, conditions are initialized uh, using uh, different initial conditions. And then we are measuring the distance mu of T of both systems while they are both driven by the same input sequence U of T. And the distance mu of t can then be approximated by an exponential function where the exponent is given by the conditional Lyapunov exponent of the system. And if the conditional Lyapunov exponent is below zero, we have generalized synchronization. And if the conditional Lyapunov exponent is above zero, we have no generalized synchronization. 
Let's have a look on the right side. You can see here for the first layer, if we increase beta one, the conditional Lyapunov exponent uh, goes or increases up to zero here, drops then, and at the Hopf bifurcation one, you can see that the uh, conditional Lyapunov exponent goes above zero. So after the Hopf bifurcation, we do not have generalized synchronization. This can, so, this can also be seen uh, for the layer two in the right region here. We have no generalized synchronization and close to the bifurcations, the uh, conditional Lyapunov exponent becomes close to zero. A small exception is given by the two crosses here that explain the region here. Um, so for the blue one, we have uh, small oscillations about the stable equilibria at zero. And uh, according to the input gain, the system is pushed at the red cross to the limit cycle. In the limit cycle, you can see we have periodic oscillations here with a much higher amplitude. And accordingly, uh, before reaching the uh, Hopf bifurcation H2, uh, we lose generalized synchronization here. Um, now we compare the memory capacity to the, to the conditional Lyapunov exponent. The memory capacity uh, was introduced by Dampa et al. in 2012. Um, to evaluate memory capacity, we feed our reservoir by an input sequence uh, with random numbers, and then we try to recall inputs and steps into the past. So we try to, uh, or we ask the uh, system if it can remember this input. Uh, we can divide the memory into two parts. There's the linear memory, which is a simple recall of this input. Um, and there is the nonlinear memory where we try to recall uh, transformed inputs. That means we have uh, the input squared or cubed, or we have also combinations of inputs at different uh, points in uh, the past. And in the paper, there's also written that the total memory is bounded by the readout dimension. So in our case, uh, it would be um, the number of layers times the nodes per layer. What we can see in the figure is that uh, in regions where the conditional Lyapunov exponent is close to zero but negative, that's the yellow regions in C, short for the bifurcations, we have a high linear memory, which, is, which are the uh, yellow uh, regions in A. And if the conditional Lyapunov exponent is more negative, the uh, nonlinear memory is uh, empowered, which you can see in B by the yellow regions. And there is a third fact, if uh, the conditional Lyapunov exponent becomes positive, uh, uh, that means regions where we do not have generalized synchronization, we have a loss of memory. This can, you can see this by the black regions in A and B here. So at first we can state that the, that the memory and the conditional Lyapunov exponent, uh, that both are related. Now moving away from the uh, feedback gains, we have a look on the uh, delays of the uh, system. Um, at first I have to state that for the single layer case, uh, there is literature which reports that resonances between clock cycle and delayed tor um, appear and that these resonances reduce the memory. Um, and we now have a look on the uh, two layer case. So we scan the delay of the first layer, tor one, and the delay of the second layer, tor two. And again, we see here uh, resonances with the clock cycle. The clock cycle is 25, so we have resonances at 25, 50, uh, 75, and 100. Um, the resonances appear in both layers, so we have also the resonances in the second layer here, and also in all kinds of memory. So we see them in the linear, we see them in the nonlinear memory, and also in the total, which is a summation of A and B. Um, what we additionally see, um, there are resonances between the delays. These are uh, the diagonals, which you can see in A and B. And um, there is always a, a trade-off between the linear and nonlinear memory. The linear memory is high in regions where the uh, tor one, uh, the, the, where the delay tor one is high, and um, the delay to uh, tor two 
is uh, lower. And if both delays are short and of the same uh, or in the same region, we have high nonlinear memory. Therefore, we can state that different delay settings empower different memory. And this is something we used in the next slide. So um, here we compared three different systems. We have an A, a single layer system where we increase the virtual nodes and therefore increase the memory. We can see that uh, increasing the virtual nodes, uh, we only increase uh, or mostly increase nonlinear memory of the quadratic uh, degree. Um, and in B, we used a deep system. The white numbers marks the layer of the system. So we have here three, four, and five layer systems. Um, and in B, every system has the same delay. The delay is at 25. So it's a small scheme here. And you can see by using this setup, we can generate, uh, generate high nonlinear memory. In C, we used a phenomenological found rule, which is shown here, uh, which helps to increase the linear memory. So I have also a scheme here with uh, the delay setting for, setting for the five-layer system. Um, but what we also can see here that in the deep systems, we have a loss of total memory, which might be a bound of the depth of such uh, deep systems. But in general, we can, say that uh, deep systems enable the tailoring of their memory so we can really uh, build up um, uh, settings which have a uh, predefined memory which is a really nice feature um, yeah and this is something uh, we can show improves the performance uh, the performance was evaluated for the uh, chaotic metric class task that means we have an input which is uh, a time series of the Mackey class uh, from the Mackey class equations, which you can see uh, by the blue dots here. And we try to predict um, using our deep system uh, 34 steps into the future. And um, yeah, the performance is uh, evaluated using the normalized root mean square error, which in general can be uh, stated as the uh, normalized difference between the uh, target and the prediction. Uh, all parameters of the uh, deep systems were found using a Bayesian optimization, that is a method known in machine learning for hyperparameter optimization, but I'm not gonna go into detail. Um, yeah, and in the figure uh, on the right, you can see a single layer reservoir, which is shown by the black line. Um, and we have several deep systems. Uh, in blue, we have 25 nodes per layer. In uh, green, we have 100 nodes per layer. And in orange, we have 200 nodes per layer. And the number in the circles defines the uh, number of layers here. So the best uh, reservoir was found for five layers with uh, 200 nodes per layer and uh, the performance can be really increased. So we can state that the performance improves with additional uh, nodes, which is known in literature, but now we can also show that uh, the performance improves with additional layers. And there is um, a nice, uh, another effect um, that we can say tailoring the memory increases the performance, but also the computation is faster. That means if we compare the five layer system here and the single layer system here, the five layer system uh, is five times faster than the single layer system while having a, a better performance, which is quite nice. Mirko, you have some four to five minutes left from your 25 minutes. Yes. Including discussion. Yes. Oh, no. Then we have an additional five minutes for discussion. Uh, sorry, I think we have 25 minutes for the talk, including discussion. Yes, yeah, that's correct. 25 in total, including discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the conclusion, the conditional react Punov exponent is related to the memory of the system. We have shown that resonances between delays and clock cycle appear in deep systems. 
and uh, we could show that deep reservoirs enabling the, uh, the tailoring of their memory using the feedback gains beta and the delays tor. And the take home message is deep time delay reservoir computing uh, enables fast computation while we can improve the performance of such systems. So thank you for your attention and yeah, I think now it's time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very oh. much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I confirm that I was wrong. Uh, we have 25 minutes in yes. total. I apologize for this confusion. So um, let's go to the questions. Uh, first of all, let me uh, mention that your uh, audience has been steadily increasing. Actually, now we have, over, we have 80 participants. And there is already one question which was put during the talk. Maybe I should just read it from Nicholas Landry. How do you control the time resolution of the time delayed reservoir if you are outputting every t equals n times theta? I assume that theta has some time scale that can't be shrunk arbitrarily. So mm -hmm. this is the Q&R uh, questions and answer session um, section. Can you? I cannot see it because. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've just read it. So maybe you could just comment how do you control the time resolution of the tabulate reservoir? Milko, in your. In your um... yes, I found it. I found it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we cannot uh, shrunk uh, theta arbitrarily. So linear uh, um, theta has to be uh, influencing the performance as well. And uh, yeah, in our case, we have set it to one. Um, so it's uh, in the time scale of the linear response time. But uh, yeah, you cannot simply uh, change it. Okay. To that all participants, mm -hmm. feel free to um, write down your questions in the mm -hmm. forum, which um, is called questions and answers. It might mm, be called differently in your different uh, languages. There Once is we... one further question, Ralph, which I can see in the chat section. It's by Shukai Ma. Um, hi, Milko. On slide 10, you showed the performance comparison between single and deep reservoir computers. How does the single reservoir computing with larger reservoir size in R? How does the single RC with larger reservoir size in R? Um, that is shown by, um, by the black line here. So the black line shows the single layer reservoir. And you can see that by increasing the uh, nodes of the network, the performance increases, but the uh, deep system is always better than the single layer system. Okay, and then we have one last question, um, which I also read from the question and answer forum. Um, it comes from Thomas Jüngling, and it's, I hope you can also see it, Mirko. It's, can you comment on the trade-off linear and nonlinear memory? Yes. Um, maybe I'm going to show the uh, slide. So, um, the trade-off between the linear and non-linear is stated in the dump at all paper because they say that the uh, total memory, which we can see in C here, is uh, bounded by the number of readout uh, or by the readout dimension. So if we have a readout dimension of 50, which we have, which we have here for this uh, figure, um, if you increase the linear and we do not have loss of total memory, the uh, nonlinear has to go down. So this is uh, something which is uh, proved in the paper. There is one more question by Ishwan Kis. Maybe, Ralph, we can allow that briefly. Delay systems often produce coexisting attractors. Did you implement some safeguards to avoid this? For example, initial conditions or limit on delays and weights? Um, we have uh, sim, uh, we have a case. Uh, you can see here in uh, figure A that we have a coexistence of uh, two stable equilibria. And for the computation, we initialized uh, our system at the lower equilibria, which is close to 
zero or one point uh, zero point one, and uh, we used a small um, input gain to do not push to uh, the system to the other equilibria. And in the case where we should show here that we have an exception um, in layer two, here the system is pushed from the stable equilibria to a limit cycle, which is caused by the input gain. So we have no safeguard. We try to use the initial conditions, but uh, we are not safe from this. Okay. Okay, thank you very much again, Mirko, for your excellent presentation. Um, to stay on schedule, we should now